Good morning. Welcome to our first plenary talk today. Our speaker is uh, Spiridula Varlocosta, and I'm delighted to present you a leading scholar in psycholinguistic research. Spiridula Varlocosta is professor of psycholinguistics at the Department of Linguistics, Faculty of Philology at the University of Athens. Her first degree was in philosophy, education, and psychology at the University of Athens. Subsequently, she continued with an MA and a PhD in theoretical linguistics at the University of Maryland. Uh, Spiridula Volocosta has worked at the University of Pennsylvania, University of Reading, and uh, the University of the Aegean. A not exhaustive list of her areas of specialization includes first and second language acquisition, language disorders, syntax, neurolinguistics, aphasia. Her publications include the book Language Acquisition and Development, a Generative View, co-authored with Marina Zacosta, and numerous articles in international journals such as the Journal of Neurolinguistics, Second Language Research, Clinical Linguistics and Disorders, and many chapters in edited volumes. She is also an elected member of the Philological Society and the Academy, the Academy of Aphasia, among others. Please join me in welcoming Spiridula Valacosta. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για την παρουσίαση και ευχαριστώ την, τα μέλη της Οργανωτικής Επιτροπής ε, που με κάλεσαν στο συνέδριο. Είναι τιμή μου και χαρά μου να είμαι εδώ. And I will switch to English uh, now. Um, in my talk, I will uh, give an uh, um, overview of what has been called non-fluent uh, agrammatic aphasia or uh, agrammatism uh, in order to present some new data from Greek on agrammatism and discuss and raise some issues about agrammatism and the very nature and existence of uh, agrammatism and also the relationship between uh, linguistic deficits and non-linguistic deficits in agrammatic aphasia. Uh, and I will start by asking the question, why is a linguist interested in language disorders and in language disorders like uh, aphasia? There are two good reasons for that. Uh, first of all, uh, to understand and interpret the pathology through linguistic theory. And second, to understand better the normal uh, process. Um, a grammatic aphasia is a, a type of acquired language disorder that has attracted the most attention from researchers interested in the relationship between uh, language deficits and linguistic theory. And what is aphasia in general? Aphasia is a, an acquired language disorder usually caused by damage to an area or some areas of the left cerebral hemisphere. It is characterized by impairments in the production and comprehension of speech, uh, by word finding difficulties, by difficulties in reading and writing, among other things. Aphasia can be caused by a cerebrovascular accident, as we call it, a CVA, uh, traumatic brain injury, tumors, or infections. In what I will say today, I will focus on aphasia after a stroke, after a CVA. Uh, despite the fact individuals with aphasia differ with respect to the kind of symptoms they show and the severity of their language disorder, uh, some syndromes can be identified that, that share a number of uh, symptoms. The main split is between uh, fluent syndromes and non-fluent syndromes, with fluency being categorized as the ability to express five or more words uninterrupted. Uh, the main types described in the literature from a number of uh, researchers are the ones you see on the screen. Uh, Non-fluent or Broca's aphasia, flu fluent or Wernicke's aphasia, and anomic aphasia are the most well-studied ones. Um, and I will start by Broca's aphasia. Uh, so in non-fluent or Broca's aphasia, the brain damage is localized in the frontal lobe, typically Broadman's, Broadman's areas 44 and 45, the so-called uh, Broca's area. Um, oops. Sorry, which is uh, this. Okay, um, and the resulting speech is non-fluent, but language comprehension is relatively well preserved. The speech of Broca's aphasics is described as slow, deliberate, and effortful, with limited vocabulary, restricted grammar, and awkward articulation. 
patients use one or two word utterances and their attempts to generate full sentences um, uh, fail due to lack of syntactic uh, support. Uh, in fluent or vernic aphasia, the brain damage is localized in the posterior part of the superior temporal gyrus, the so-called Broadman's area uh, 22. This one, this is the vernicus area. And the resulting speech is fluent and characterized by paraphasias and poor comprehension. Um, uh, the speech of individuals with anomic aphasia is fluent and grammatically correct. And the main characteristic of anomia is um, uh, difficulties in recalling words, names, and numbers. And this is an overview of the aphasia types according to their fluency, comprehension abilities, repetition abilities, and the main characteristic. Um, let us now move to what a grammatism is. A grammatism is a pattern of language production that appears to lack grammatical structure, and it is often associated with damage to Broca's area, the area that we saw before. However, Damage to Broca's area does not necessarily result in Broca's agrammatic aphasia, and Broca's agrammatic aphasia is not necessarily caused by damage to Broca's area. The current consensus is that the damage in Broca's aphasia probably includes parts of uh, Broca's area, as well as some adjacent structures, which, however, are still unknown to uh, researchers. And some quite recent findings suggest that individuals with Broca's aphasia have damage to both Broca's and Verdicus uh, areas. Agrammatism has traditionally been defined as a morphosyntactic impairment characterized by decrease in speech rate and by omission and or substitution of bound and free grammatical morphemes and by use of simplified syntactic structures by poor grammar. This so-called uh, co-occurrence of uh, symptoms is often described as telegraphic uh, speech as in uh, first language acquisition. Um, Cross-linguistic studies indicate that individuals with agrammatic aphasia have selective grammatical deficits affecting some but not all grammatical morphemes and functional categories. In the verbal domain, for example, tense appears to be significantly more impaired than subject-verb um, agreement, as has been shown in a number of languages, including Greek, uh, by a number of researchers. In the verbal domain, case appears, appears to be more impaired compared to gender, uh, because most substitution errors in article production concern case, uh, at least in Dutch, as has been shown by, um, uh, by uh, Bastianze and colleagues 2003. Uh, besides morphosyntactic deficits, some core syntactic operations like movement are also impaired in the production uh, of agrammatic speakers, and this is evidenced in structures that have a non-canonical word order, such as passives, uh, object, uh, object clefts, object relative clauses, object WH questions. Greater difficulty is also observed in the production of verbs uh, compared to the production of uh, nouns, and in the production of verbs with uh, complex argument structure, uh, for example, differences between transitives and detransitives, differences between anergatives and unaccusatives, as has been shown by Cagle and Thompson in various uh, works uh, of, of theirs. Um, although the impairment was originally described for production, a number of studies have shown similar difficulties in morphosyntactic comprehension. This is, uh, this is what Karamatza and Zurif in uh, 1976 call uh, asyntactic comprehension. And the main pattern, uh, or the most well-discussed pattern of asyntactic comprehension is difficulties in uh, non-canonical uh, structures, uh, structures with non-canonical word order, such as object clefts, object uh, relatives, etc. However, according to Kaplan, for example, it is not the case that there is something unique in the kind of comprehension problems observed in agrammatic speakers. The pattern of asyntactic comprehension is not found in all agrammatic speakers, and it is present in some non-agrammatic speakers, and this is something that we will discuss uh, shortly. 
So uh, because of all this, the, the, the question, what is a grammatism, remains open, despite the fact that Goodglass and, uh, and colleagues 2001 describe a grammatism with the characteristics that you see on the screen and which I will not go through because I have already discussed them. Uh, I will now move on to the relationship between memory and uh, a grammatism. Um, Non-linguistic deficits, particularly deficits in memory, are also observed in agrammatic aphasia and contribute significantly to several language uh, functions. The basic distinction regarding memory system, the memory system, is between shorter memory and long-term memory. Uh, shorter memory refers to the ability to remember information received through auditory and visual channels for a brief period of time immediately after this information is registered. Information in shorter memory is short-lived and can last up to 30 seconds, so it is a temporary memory uh, system. Short chunks that is a unit that is chunks of uh, information long-term memory on the other hand refers to the ability to remember over a much longer time period uh, working memory is another temporary memory system used for mentally manipulating information uh, some researchers do not make a distinction between shorter memory and working memory, whereas other researchers like Badley make a distinction between the two. And for those that make a distinction between the two, shorter, shorter memory refers to the ability to recall information immediately after its presentation in a relatively unprocessed state uh, that is without mental manipulation. So short, shorter memory is about storage. Working memory, on the other hand, uh, entails mental manipulation uh, of uh, information. Um, this is the, uh, this is Badley's multi-component model of working memory, which comprises of several uh, buffers that are responsible for uh, uh, auditory verbal uh, uh, and visual spatial visual spatial uh, uh, information, as well as an ex a central executive, uh, which basically, um, uh, uh, which basically um, uh, manipulates information that are held temporarily in uh, these uh, uh, buffers. Now, uh, short-term deficits uh, um, consist deficits in the uh, phonological loop, uh, whereas uh, working memory deficits consist deficits in the central executive. Uh, a strong connection between linguistic and short-term impairments has been um, uh, has been shown in the literature, and a lot of uh, and a lot of researchers point out that, for example, digit repetition is a major predictor of receptive and expressive language uh, performance, and also a predictor of spoken language comprehension. Working memory deficits are also observed in agrammatic aphasia, as has been shown by a number of uh, researchers who argue that water, uh, working memory underpins both spoken and reading skills in uh, aphasia. There is a lot of literature, there is huge literature that I'm not going to go into, and I, I will just point out that there are some methodological uh, limitations in uh, some of the studies. For example, a lot of, some of the studies lack a control group, uh, which is important for this comparison. Uh, some of the studies use uh, only verbal measures of uh, memory, and in a lot of studies, shorter memory and working memory measures require speech output. That's potentially a problem because uh, speakers with aphasia have at the same time, some of them may have articulatory deficits, which are distinct deficits, as well as anomia. However, despite all these debates and, and, and problems, short-term memory, there is a consensus that short-term memory and working memory impairments are a common feature in most people with aphasia. And now we will move on to an, a, a characteristic, another characteristic of uh, uh, agrammatism, which is variability. Within and between individual variability in the patterns of agrammatic performance across various languages has been shown by a number of studies and a number of researchers. This variability is attributable to the variability in the degree of the severity of the language impairment, according to some researchers, or to the fact that different sub-modules sub, uh, of the grammar 
can be impaired in different patients by other researchers, for example, by Drugs and Marshall, um, 1995, who tried to explain this way the fact that one of their patients showed better performance on passives than on actives, which is exactly the opposite of what an agrammatic speaker supposedly does. This variability issue has raised also the debate uh, uh, group studies versus case studies raised by Karamadze and his colleagues, in which I, will, I don't have time to get into. And I will now discuss some accounts, uh, accounts of agrammatism. And there are two kinds of hypotheses that have been postulated. Uh, on the one hand, representational uh, structural competence accounts, and on the other hand, processing or performance accounts. Um, representational accounts suggest that part of the grammatical knowledge is lost in speakers with a grammatical aphasia, uh, whereas processing accounts argue that grammatical representations are intact, but at least uh, uh, some of them are not accessible to speakers with a grammatical aphasia because of their uh, processing working memory uh, limitations. I will say, as uh, Mary <laughs> said yesterday, Sorry. I will now go through some represent representational accounts, uh, and I will focus first on accounts that are trying to explain the production deficit, and I will focus on the dissociation between tense and uh, agreement. Um, there are a bunch of so-called uh, pruning accounts. Uh, the most well known and discussed is the tree pruning hypothesis advocated by Friedman and Grudzinski in 1997, according to which the, the syntactic tree of agrammatical phasic speakers is pruned at the tense node, thus a deviance performance is expected in temporary relations, as well as in relations or dependencies that are above the T uh, node. This account has been criticized by myself in uh, various works, as well as by uh, Nanusi and colleagues uh, 2006, because uh, there is evidence from Greek aphasia that um, categories like aspect, which are placed uh, lower in the tree, are the most impaired in a grammatic aphasia. Uh, uh, there are also uh, the so-called underspecification accounts that are trying to, uh, to explain the production deficit and the deficit, the tense deficit. And one of them is the dense underspecification hypothesis advocated by Klaassen and, and colleagues in various work. According to this hypothesis, the selective difficulties a grammatic speakers face with tense in production and in comprehension are due to the underspecification of tense in the T infl uh, node. The idea is that tense inflection is an interpretable feature and it is as it is relevant for semantic interpretation agreement on the other hand is uninterpretable okay for reasons that you all uh, know and the selective pattern of under specification is due to the fact that tense um, tense marking is an anaphoric dependency because it requires to get the event time from this course and anaphoric uh, dependencies are vulnerable in agrammatism, and there is plenty of evidence from, for example, anaphora phenomena. So the idea is that tense is, for these reasons, uh, vulnerable. Agreement, on the other hand, which is a pure syntactic relation, it's checking operation, is not susceptible to this underspecification. Uh, Burkhardt and colleagues, 2005, have a similar account. In their account, either tense or agreement, or both can be underspecified, and they postulate this account in order to explain the double dissociation between the two categories in some of their patients. Uh, so, so some of their patients had deficit in tense, some of the patients had deficit in agreement, some of the patients had deficits in both, and some of their patients had deficit in nothing. So this is variability. There are limitations uh, with both of these accounts because they cannot explain the production of uh, embedded, for example, structures or structures, uh, WH dependencies and dependencies that have
safety is a problem for this kind of accounts, but it's not a problem for um, processing accounts, according to which performance should vary according to the severity of the processing limitation and the complexity of the task. There are uh, processing accounts come in two flavors, I would say. Accounts that resort solely to non-linguistic competencies, such as limitations in working memory capacity or in online computation. I will not discuss them at all. And accounts that resort as well to linguistically sophisticated notions of morphosyntactic or sentence complexity, complexity, such as the account, such as generalized minimality advocated by Grillo 2009, or the argument structure complexity hypothesis advocated by Thompson 2003, or Avruti's account uh, in various work of his that resort to the uh, processing of dependencies that require, uh, you know, uh, the interfaces, for example, the syntax, uh, pragmatics, uh, discourse interface. I will discuss a bit of routine and uh, Grillo very briefly. Um, um, Okay. Uh, Avrut in 2000 argues that tense is more difficult to produce than agreement because it is computationally more uh, complex. Uh, the idea is that determining agreement inflection is a purely, as we said, grammatical operation, which requires the five features of the sentential subject and the verb to match. To determine now the correct uh, tense inflection, discourse information is required. And according to Avrutin, it is this integration of information at the interfaces that leads to overload of the computational capacities of individuals with a grammatic aphasia. Uh, there is plenty of evidence that integration of information at different levels of representation is difficult with, for, for individuals with a grammatic aphasia, and it comes from studies on anaphora, on uh, differences between referential versus non-referential WH questions, or from studies on the processing of null uh, subjects in null subject languages, or the reflexive, non-reflexive distinction in, uh, um, in sentence with non-active voice uh, morphology, to, to name a few. Uh, Grillo 2009 uh, proposes a processing account to account for the asyntactic comprehension shown in uh, uh, non-canonical structures. Grillo suggests that because of their reduced processing uh, uh, capacities, agrammatic individuals lack the ability to activate or maintain a complete array of five features in their syntactic presentation, which thus get impoverished. So uh, the syntactic representation of a cleft or a relative clause uh, for, a, for a typical uh, speaker is like this, okay? All features are there, specified, but the syntactic representation of a, of a, rel of a cleft or a relative clause for an agrammatic speaker is like this, where some of the features, as you see, are underspecified, okay? Um, if a syntactic representation is underspecified in terms of some features, uh, and if these features are necessary to distinguish between the moved element and the intervening element, okay? Uh, the moved element and the intervening element, um, uh, then minimality in the sense of Ritchie 2004 will block chain formation between the moved DP and its uh, copy. Uh, and features that are um, in the left periphery, like uh, quantificational discourse, are more vul vulnerable than, for example, argumental features in this account. Now, there are problems with processing accounts. The main problem is the definition of complexity, because it, 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 it has been defined uh, linguistically and non-linguistically, and there are a lot of definitions. I'm not going to get into this. I don't have time. But there are empirical problems as well with processing accounts. There is evidence from my tracking experiments that agrammatic speakers do not always display deficits in automatic uh, syntactic processing. And uh, recent work by Thompson and her colleagues uh, sh um, shows that uh, uh, agrammatic speakers show similar eye movement patterns compared to controls by correctly fixating um, on the picture that corresponds to the moved element. So this is, this is a problem. So let us sum up. Within and between individual variability in the patterns of a grammatic performance across various languages is a problem for the definition of agrammatism, as well as for an interpretative account of agrammatism, particularly, as we saw, a representational one. Uh, 
For this reason, some researchers have questioned uh, the very notion of agrammatism, uh, since it cannot be defined or does not correspond to anything that exists. Enough with agrammatism, it seems like a ghost term, and it does not correspond to anything uncontroversial. So let's get rid of it, is Karamatis approach, and uh, this is the opposite of Krudzinski's approach. And as some of you may realize, that's the approach I want to take from now on. Um, conceptual as well as empirical problems in, um, uh, raised in the aphasia literature demand a deeper investigation of linguistic and non-linguistic data, um, linguistic deficits, sorry, and their interrelation. And the goal of the project I will present and the goal of research aphasia, I think, is to improve our understanding of linguistic deficits in post-stroke aphasia and relate them to their cognitive uh, demands in order to have a more complete picture, okay? And then raise questions like representations or processing and maybe reuptake all the issues that have been discussed till now in the literature and which lead to a dead end according to my view uh, now. And Greek is a nice language to do so, all of you know why. It has a fully blown uh, morphological system, verbal and nominal, and it has complex syntactic dependencies, anaphoric phenomena, reflexive, non-reflexive distinctions, um, non in, uh, with non-active morphology, referentiality, which is different from other languages, etc. So that's the Thalys aphasia project, um, which um, started in 2012 and ends at the end of 2015. The aims of the project were first an in-depth investigation of different linguistic levels in aphasia and their interrelation, the study of the relationship between non-linguistic disorders and linguistic disorders, um, the evaluation of aphasic disorders, their symptoms and level of severity, in relation to the location and extent of left hemisphere damage, and last, an in-depth investigation of the efficacy of different types of therapy intervention in aphasia. I'm not going to discuss the last two, although there is a lot of interesting findings and work done uh, on this. I'm going to concentrate on the first two. Um, with regards to uh, the investigation of different linguistic levels, we have, been, we have examined morphosyntactic production and comprehension, complex syntax production and comprehension, as well as narrative production. And we have created the uh, Greek aphasia corpus. And if you want to learn more about it and the annotation system that we have developed, you should go to George's talk, Markopoulos and Karasimus this afternoon. Uh, as far as the study of the relationship between non-linguistic and linguistic disorders, we have designed a battery that tests various cognitive functions, including short-term memory and working memory. And the innovation of the project is, one of the innovations, is that we have a strict, as we call it, cognitive screen, which is something that, that we don't see in a lot of other, in a lot of studies that on Greek and on many other languages. And I will discuss what this is shortly. Up to now, we have seen 92 patients with a left uh, CVA, so a stroke that has affected their left hemisphere, aged 29 to 85. Uh, 20 patients did not pass the cognitive screen. Uh, they, they were found to have uh, cognitive impairments, for example, signs of dementia, and they were not further assessed. These were older patients, okay? Of the remaining uh, 72, only 25 were relevant for a linguistic uh, assessment because uh, a lot of them had global aphasia. In global aphasia, you, say you, you have no production and you have very, very limited comprehension. And some of them had no aphasia at all. They were not aphasics, aphasics even though they had a stroke. So they were uh, exempt. I will present today preliminary results from 12 patients and 10 controls, uh, that is no, uh, 10 non-brain damaged uh, native speakers, age and education matched. The time post onset for the 12 patients was 12 months to 50 months. This means that they were assessed uh, at least 12 months after they had a stroke. And in this table, you see the demographic information of the 12 patients. And as you can see, most of them are male. And also, as you can see, they are quite young, okay? Not old people. 
The baseline assessment included the cognitive screen, which included Raven's colored progressive matrices and also Matisse's dementia rating scale uh, to assess uh, non-verbal uh, intelligence and to exclude, uh, as I said, some of the speakers. Uh, it included the adaptation uh, of the Boston Diagnostic Aphasia Examination Test uh, uh, by Papathanasiou. This is a test that diagnoses aphasia and it includes um, assessment of many modalities, production, comprehension, um, auditory, visual, gestural, etc. We also included the Greek adaptation of the Boston naming test. It's a test about naming. And also we included spontaneous speech data, uh, which included a picture description, the cookie theft, uh, the picture that you see uh, on the screen from the BDAE. It included narration of their stroke story, as well as the full narrative protocol that we designed in um, in Thalys to evaluate fluency, um, MLU, uh, percentage of grammatical sentences and verb noun ratio, among other things. Uh, we had also the neuropsychological battery that we designed and today I will present just some data from non-word repetition uh, from sentence repetition, from uh, some fluency tasks, which basically assess the ability of speakers to name as many X verbs, uh, uh, animals, furniture, from digit span forward, from digit span backward, and from spatial span forward and spatial span uh, backward. These are the uh, uh, cognitive assessments. And let me explain what digit span is. In digit span, uh, um, um, uh, the person uh, hears um, uh, from the exam uh, digits in a certain order and he has to repeat the digits in the order that he uh, hears them in the forward and in the backward he has to do it in the uh, with the reverse order okay the spatial span is non-verbal uh, the the participant has to point to some cubes uh, which again in the order that uh, the examiner presented them in the forward and in the backward uh, in the reverse order okay and to remind you for those of you that are so familiar, digit span forward assesses um, uh, verbal short-term memory uh, and spatial span forward uh, non-verbal and digit span backward uh,
However, we found the subject-object asymmetry in relative clauses, okay? And this is in accordance with Caraf and Grillo and Grillo, but not with the three patients that we have with um, Vespina, Papadopoulou, Neradzini, Michaela, and Rolin Bastianza in this uh, study. Now, the rightmost, it's only four speakers uh, up to now, but as we speak, we have much more data which I could not include in the presentation because we had to do all the analysis. Um, it's tense and tense aspect uh, agreement. Uh, tense is relatively, is very low, okay? Uh, the interesting thing is that in the tense aspect of the agreement, we basically found, we replicated the pattern that we had in previous uh, works, like in Parlocosta and colleagues 2006, or in Pindani's Parlocosta and Tsapkini, uh, as well as in Anusi uh, and colleagues, because we found that the difference between tense and agreement was significant, tense and aspect was significant, and aspect and agreement was significant as well, okay? Now, this is the production data, it's the individual data, uh, this is the WH and this is the TENS, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there is a lot of variability, I'm not going to discuss it, you can see it here, but here there is much less variability. All patients showed a, a significant difference between agreement and aspect, for example, okay? And apart from one, they showed also a difference between agreement and TENS. Um, this is the comprehension um, result from case and uh, agreement grammaticality. It's also the case production, and it's uh, low, as you can see. And this is in accordance with Bastianze, the Blesser, and colleagues, but not with Rugendrich and, uh, and uh, Friedman, who argue that case is not impaired as long as the case assigner is there, okay? The case assigner was there in our task, but case was impaired. Uh, what's interesting is that case, comprehension of case, is more impaired than, com than comprehension of subject-verb uh, agreement, and that's what we will discuss in uh, the Science of Aphasia with Arcondo and other colleagues. Um, and this is the, uh, again, results from comprehension. It's the WH relative clauses, uh, free relatives uh, task, okay? Again, interestingly, no subject-object asymmetries in uh, WH questions, referential or non-referential. Actually, this is not in accordance with previous research of mine, or with Garafa and Grillo, or with Grillo. Uh, but again, interestingly, in comprehension, we saw the um, uh, dissociation between uh, subject and object. Uh, research of ours. Um, this is the, the, the individual data in the case tasks. There is much less variability here, and it's interesting why here it's less variability. All of the patients, in all of the patients, case was worse uh, than agreement, and only in one or two patients, it's equally, it was equally well. But there was not a single patient where agreement was, was worse than case, for example. In, in the WH tasks, you see a lot of patterns, okay? You see better subjects than objects, better objects than subjects, equal performance, etc. And this is, again, the individual data from the comprehension of WH dependencies, lots of variability here. So, um, uh, we have observed serious linguistic impairments in both production and comprehension. Um, and interestingly, the patterns of asyntactic comprehension were not always observed in uh, uh, the group data, and that's very interesting. So, for example, there was no subject-object dissociation in between referential and non-referential questions, both in the production and in the comprehension, and, uh, and the pattern of asyntactic comprehension was not also observed in all the individual data. Now, we have evidence that I have not presented that patterns of asyntactic comprehension are observed in patients with, no, with fluent output and signs of anomia. I did not present it. I have it with me and I can show it to you because right now it's from one patient, okay? And we have evidence that patterns of uh, agrammatic production, for example, the dissociation between agreement and tense or agreement and aspect, um, is also present in healthy controls, which is also interesting. So. So much for agrammatism, okay? It's, um, um, you can see why. Um, uh, we observed also serious non-linguistic impairments in shortened memory and working memory. And the obvious question is, uh, uh, um, how are the observed linguistic deficits related 
to the shorter memory, working memory deficits? And I don't have a clear answer because that's something that I have just started thinking about, but I will show you some results which are interesting and I think that's the way that I will go about. Uh, uh, these are, uh, these are uh, analysis of possible correlations in the performance of uh, patients in the uh, cognitive tasks, okay, and the linguistic tasks, okay, and I would like you to focus on this, okay. Uh, there was a correlation, okay, between a relative close object, the relative close object, performance or on relative closest object dependencies, or free relatives object, with the digit span backward, which assesses basically working uh, memory. And the working hypothesis is that if we have more data, okay, that we should see these correlations, okay, so structures like object relatives or free re relatives with object dependencies, which are complex and they require a lot of manipulation, okay, of information, this should uh, correlate with measurements on um, working memory, um, on working memory, okay? So, so um, there is a lot of work in progress. Uh, we are working on a larger data set that incorporates more patients with a profile with the profile described in this talk, the non-fluent profile, as well as with another group of patients with a different profile, more fluent output and signs of anomia in order to examine first whether the results that are reported here today are replicated in a larger cohort of non-fluent patients. Second, whether the so-called asyntactic comprehension characterizes fluent patients as well. And third, whether linguistic impairments correlate with non-linguistic ones in the different cohorts of patients and in what ways the they correlate. We are also working on relating processing to impairments in specific representations. Particularly, we have designed eye tracking studies, eye tracking experiments to assess processing of complex dependencies that till now we have studied only with offline tasks, like anaphoric relations, WH dependencies, and argument structure complexity. And last but not least, we are working on relating the aphasic deficits observed to lesion size and site and this is not something that I did not discuss because I thought it was not very relevant for for this uh, audience uh, these are my collaborators and I would like to thank particularly some of them for the wonderful collaboration we we have uh, and I hope that we will have uh, more and I would like to thank uh, all the patients and all the participants that uh, took part in uh, the Thalys and helped us understand a bit better what a facial is, is all about and thank you Okay, thank you very much for the interesting and informative talk. Are there any questions? Yes. Okay, I think uh, uh, for, I, I have a suggestion about uh, ca the case issue. Um, there, there are two theories, okay? One theory is, is that cases are signed by tense and aspect. Uh, another theory is that case is morphological, morphological and it's assigned at the PF component or after co syntactic computation uh, and it takes into account the syntactic configuration. On both theories you are predicting perhaps uh, what, you, what you see. Uh, in the one case, uh, because if tense and aspect are impaired, also case will be impaired. In the, in the other case, because the, uh, you assign the case after the computation has finished, so you have a lot of computing to do. You have to do a co global computing. So my suggestion is uh, to, to see whether the results that you have with case correlate with the results that you have with tense and aspect or not. And then depending on whether it correlates or not, you go for the one explanation or for the other explanation, okay? Exactly, I agree yeah. completely. We did not, I have not done these correlations, okay? We did not do, I did not have to t time and I could not ask colleagues <laughs> to do these correlations, uh, but that's exactly what we plan. So we plan to do correlations also between the uh, linguistic uh, um, uh, tasks, okay? To see whether there are dependencies of this sort because that's the direction uh, we want to take about case, okay? And to compare it with agreement and see whether, because there is a difference also with agreement and also uh, present why there is such a difference. I mean, I told you that we are um, 
working with Arjondo on Marangi's theory and uh, Pesetsky and Torego's theory and see whether, you know, what they predict can help us interpret the, the difference. Yeah. And the other thing has to do with the WH questions. Yeah. Uh, also, also the controls. Uh, also people like, uh, I mean, if it's intervention, uh, as Grillo says, yeah, yeah. then you expect this variation Absolutely. Uh, because you see this uh, you see this cross linguistically and you see it within the same language some people getting intervention effects some not uh, and some languages having them and exactly. some not and it's uh, very very interesting for you perhaps to look at a, a paper uh, by Holmberg and Sigerson mm -hmm. who study Icelandic and the defective intervention effect there and they show they, they show that consistently you have three kinds uh, three groups of, of speakers and I think it's the same in, okay. in many many languages great so Thank it's, you very it's much supporting this. your point that it's not specific to uh, uh, aphasia uh, perhaps, but uh, more general part. And, and this has been actually shown in the literature. So, for example, uh, uh, Crane, and I don't remember the other authors, it's a, it's a paper written some years ago. They show that uh, uh, con uh, normal native speakers with non-brain damage have difficulties in this type in, in object dependencies, particularly if you if they are pressed and if, the, if their processing uh, sources are uh, limited. Okay, so you see this dissociation even in normal speakers. And I have not looked at our control group yet to see whether we have this. Thank you. It's great to see that there are consistent pa patterns even when there is so much variation between the patients. I want to come back to the issue of case as well and to ask what kind of case errors, so what kind of, which cases are affected, so is it in the production, okay? Yeah, okay. is it a specific I'll, I'll case? You. Is it tell, specific um, okay. so, uh, related to specific thematic? Um, uh, I'll tell you whatever I can remember now, okay? So in the production, we assessed nominative and accusative, and there were errors in, uh, in both. I don't remember now whether the difference was significant. I can't recall right now, because that's what we presented actually in Cyprus, but I don't call whether there is significance there. In the comprehension, uh, in the grammaticality judgment, we had uh, structures where you had verb, DP, DP, which was verb, nominative, accusative, verb, uh, accusative, nominative, and verb, nominative, nominative, and verb, accusative, accusative. Now, there was a significant difference between the grammatical and the non-grammatical, and there were differences between, I mean, the accusative accusative was the most, um, uh, I mean, this is where they made the more errors, and the, the, the difference was significant. I mean, I, I have to go back and look at the data and look again at the data, because yes, there are interesting patterns that, um, you know, we have to... Because that means then that there is an interaction between word order and case absolutely, information. Absolutely, absolutely rather than the issue of them having difficulty with particular case morphemes. With case, and example. you expect yeah. this actually yeah. in a language yeah. like Greek. Yeah, so that's really interesting. And the other point is, it will also be interesting, you presented correlations with digit span, which is a, a verbal memory. It would be interesting to see that there is no correlation with the special uh, there was no, so, that's why yeah. I didn't put them. There was yeah. no correlation at all so with special. Fits. So yeah. whatever you saw in this um, table uh, were the correlations that turned out to be uh, significant, okay? But the data is limited, so there may be more correlations. But in the spa with the spatial pan span, it was really, you yeah. know. Okay. So that's yeah. good, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think uh, there's a last short question, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, as for the difference between WH questions and relative clauses, it seems to me that the relative clauses are the ones that would be uh, uh, in which discourse related factors would be uh, less relevant. So this is where I think the intervention, uh, an intervention type of theory would predict that, you know, the subject object asymmetry would come uh, more clearly and you would expect to find less uh, variation, which it seems to me that it is what you... That's what that, we get. What you, what you get, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't exactly understand your... Was it a methodological point that we should first do the cognitive tasks and then try to assess 
the processing or the representational theories was that so you uh, no um, you know I decided to present the baseline tasks first and the baseline tasks are the BDA the BNT and the full uh, battery of uh, neuropsychological assessments and then I presented the linguistic uh, stuff now how did we assess this okay a patient was entering the project okay and he had to go through the cognitive screen if he passed it he went through assessment and then he was taking the BDA uh, the BNT uh, other tests that assess quality of life we had a lot of baseline tasks and 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 then he was assessed in the linguistic material and then he was going to therapy okay etc cetera, etc cetera. Okay, so I, that was the way i thought you made a more general point when you talked you know against uh, uh a grammatism i did <laughs> right yeah. and that's what i didn't uh, get, the actually. point was okay i mean the whole discussion of a grammatism is that there is a condition okay specific to uh, uh, particular patients that, ha that have a non-fluent bro uh, profile and they are Broca's aphasics and it this these uh, these uh, patients have uh, uh, production deficits but also uh, asyntactic comprehension okay that that's that's the idea that Grodzinski and other people class uh, you know uh, put forward uh, uh, what I said is that uh, there are problems with um, um, uh, the fact that uh, um, uh, there is a lot of variability okay that you don't see uh, these uh, patterns uh, in all uh, uh, speakers okay and also that these patterns uh, you see them in other patients that don't have this profile file and I have the data from this one patient and also in in controls in in native speakers I mean the, uh, if the pattern is a pattern that a native speaker has okay then it's not something specific to a grammatism the idea that I have I mean and the idea that I believe and I will explore right now is that this is a, a spectrum okay in the lines of uh, for example research in uh, developmental disorders where a lot of people believe in a spectrum okay and it's not that there, there are no conditions such as a grammatism okay I mean it's it's crazy to believe uh, in it uh, but there are patterns okay and um, people like this that have suffered uh, you know a stroke and have limitations okay uh, in their working memory and also have uh, lesions uh, that are big and uh, or spread okay may show this pattern in a more um, you know um, prominent way okay Th that's the idea i don't know whether that was clear yeah i'm afraid you have to stop here thank so you thank you again very much